Hello, welcome to another lecture. So this one is um, all about climate change. It's actually part of two lectures. So this is climate change part one. Um, so climate change, well, we hear about it a lot at the moment on our news. Uh, I'm sure you're all aware that something's going on with the climate of basically our planet um, over recent years and especially over recent decades. Uh, this thing called global warming, which I'm sure you've heard of. Um, so the world's climate is now, we know from, you know, from data, from, from many different sources, uh, global climate is warming, uh, sea surface temperatures are increasing, and that's causing all sorts of knock-on effects for um, climate around the world, such as things such as um, sea level rise, um, which is causing coastal flooding in many low-lying regions of countries or, or whole countries in countries like Bangladesh, for example. Um, so Bangladesh is very low lying. It's only a, a meter or two great uh, large areas of it. So it's mainly built on a large river delta above sea level. So the large recent uh, sea level rises are causing a lot of erosion of that delta front and flooding of communities along the rivers which um, in that area. Also think of islands like, the, for example, the Maldive Islands in the Indian Ocean, uh, lots of the um, small islands in the Pacific Ocean. Uh, they're having to deal with uh, an, a, no, climate change really as a, as a serious uh, threat to their almost existence. Uh, many of these islands are only a couple of meters on, on coral atolls um, above sea level. So this rise, which is projected, we'll talk about this in, in part two, the projected to be around about a meter by the end of this century, the 21st century, um, it's really significant. Um, other things that climate change is causing, you hear about wildfires, on the news now, you never really used to, uh, but now it's quite common every summer, um, every season you have uh, these wildfire stories, be they in Southern California, be they in Canada recently, be they in Siberia, Australia, Italy um, quite recently. Um, and wildfires, when you look into the research, they're actually not becoming that more frequent, but they're becoming much more intense and larger sort of conflagrations. Um, um, when these, when these fires take hold, uh, especially due to prolonged droughts. So we hear about droughts, uh, especially in, again, places like Southern California or Australia. Um, so countries which are quite arid climate anyway, but it can become over that threshold, become really arid. And that's causing issues, you know, for uh, water management um, as, a, uh, as a resource uh, for drinking and for agriculture, for example, and for industry. Um, so, Climate change, like I say, it, it affects more or less every, or it actually does affect every nation on the planet now. Uh, we used to think of it something, you know, happens to someone else, uh, but it doesn't. It really happens to um, everyone. Um, in the United Kingdom, uh, there's increased flooding, uh, river floods in sort of Northwest Europe now very much because of increased storminess. And, and on that same subject, um, hurricanes. Uh, remember Hurricane Katrina? Uh, back in 2004, 2005, 2004, um, major Category 5 hurricane, well, they're going to happen more frequently. Very intense high category hurricanes. We see a trend of increasing um, um, high intensity hurricanes. Um, and that's due to warmer sea surface temperatures, which kind of drive evaporation and the formation of hurricanes in the tropics. Um, other things, you see, you see droughts, uh, more flooding. Sea level rise, hurricanes, wildfires, uh, water management issues, and uh, several other aspects which we'll, we'll mention in, in today and, and tomorrow. Um, so in this lecture, part one, I'm, I'll be starting off by um, explaining the difference between weather, as a term, and climate. Weather is basically very local on a short scale. Climate is sort of averaged weather over a longer time scale. And it's climate you really need to keep an eye on as far as trends uh, year on year, or decade on decade even. Um, we'll be having a look at uh, what uh, climate uh, climate controls, uh, what controls climate, often either globally or, or regionally. Um, will we look at the atmosphere, the composition firstly of the atmosphere, so different gases and the structure of the atmosphere. And that leads on to the subject of um, global warming or the greenhouse effect, so atmospheric heating and global warming, so the science behind that. Um, and to do with related to that, the, um, the amount of greenhouse gases, as I call it, in the atmosphere that are increasing and causing global warming, 
because uh, that's really the direct cause. Um, how do humans have an influence on that? Uh, yes, we do, just categorically. Yes, we are uh, the principal cause of um, 20th and 21st century uh, global warming at a very accelerated rate. Um, and how are we doing about it? So we, well, I'll, I'll tell you about how, how different inputs of uh, greenhouse gas from uh, human activities. Um, and then finally, we look at uh, records of past climates. So let's look at the past to see natural variation in climates. And if we can see, are we just on a wave, you know, of a, of a warming period, for example, because we do get cooling and warming variations right through Earth's history, uh, and especially over sort of recent the recent sort of death, uh, centuries and thousands of years, we've got very good records of, of climate change now. Um, so I'll go, go through the different methods of how we reconstruct climate. And then in part two, the next lecture, we'll talk about how those um, compare to the, to the current and projected rates of climate change. And we'll see uh, the hugely accelerated rates, much faster uh, change than we've seen in the natural world uh, before basically uh, the Industrial Revolution of the, the 1900s. All right, so uh, let's start off with uh, this opener, which is two inches of quite dramatic weather. A uh, snowstorm on the left and a sort of thunderstorm with lightning on the right. And if you describe, you know, it was a rainy day, it was a thunderstorm, it was a blizzard today. That's what we call weather. So that's the um, weather at a, certain de at a certain location, at a certain time. So it's very local and time specific. Uh, they very much influence our daily lives, weather, you know, especially if you look at the picture on the left, um, as far as, you know, going about your day. Um, but that's, as I say, that's that's what describes weather. You know, when people say, hey, it was the, the coldest winter day, and, you know, the biggest blizzard in a long time, and everyone's going on about global warming. Well, you have to forget about these one-off events with weather. You have to think of the longer trends with climate, because that tells you the overall picture of changing uh, uh, climate. So some definitions, weather and climate, weather, the state of the atmosphere at a particular place over a short period of time, um, because that's very variable, constantly changing. Climate is over a longer period of time, uh, months, years, and generalized composite of weather or average weather, so mean temperatures, mean uh, rainfall, etc. So, for example, on on that point, here's some uh, uh, in this case temperature graphs for uh, chart for um, temperatures uh, variability over a year. So, a monthly changes uh, from January on the left of December, and here this is for New York City. So, daily temperature data for New York City. Each graph shows the average daily high and low temperatures for each month, and also extremes. Um, so, you can think of the highest. Uh, daily, uh, the record daily highs uh, for New York City, uh, almost you know over in, in Fahrenheit, um, over Far over 100 Fahrenheit, over 40 degrees Celsius, etc. Or the average daily high, average daily low, uh, record daily low, etc. And and the minima during the winter as well, during January. Um, this is climate records. Their means, their averages is the key. And you compare these uh, year on year, decade on year, decade, and then you'll start to see trends in changes in the in the mean temperatures or the mean highs or the mean lows, etc. Uh, so global climate uh, refers to pers uh, persistent weather patterns, and these patterns include long-term uh, regional trends. And uh, these trends, like like in the last slide, include maxima and minima, maybe for temperature, but also other aspects. Uh, which I'll list, uh, ranges and timing. So as well as temperature in climate data, you can think of other variables, um, air pressure, um, uh, humidity, precipitation, important one obviously, um, wind speed, wind conditions, uh, and, and storminess, etc. So all these things, you can look for trends. Uh, are they increasing? Are they decreasing? Are they staying the same uh, with time? And once you get a, an idea of those trends, then you can say, hey, yes, we're going through climate change. Temperatures are increasing. There's higher storm, a large, more intense storm events, etc. cetera. Uh, so what controls climate? Uh, first of all, sort of natural controls of climate, um, sort of con uh, consistent controls. Um, uh, whereas climate climatic conditions are governed by several factors. Firstly, uh, this first slide, uh, we'll go for a few slides on this. Um, latitude, 
um, um, on uh, north or south of the equator, basically the warmest um, temperatures, as you can see on, on, on the uh, maps on the right, um, are around the equator. In this case, it's sort of the reds and orange, orange colors in the middle. Um, and the sort of the blues and going through to the, the greys at the top being the coldest, um, the further the higher latitudes, so towards the poles. Um, so why did why is that? Basically, um, your latitude determines the amount of insulation. I'll mention this. I'll um, come back to this point in uh, part two. So we won't really talk about it too much today, but we will in the follow-on lecture uh, about this. Um, so basically, there's, there's less insulation incoming. Uh, solar radiation um, in in the northern the sorry the um, the high latitudes at the poles of the planet, and more it's more concentrated at the equator, hence the warmer temperatures. So hotter near the uh, equator, um, colder near the poles, and the seasonal variation as well. Um, uh, due to that, so you can see here's January uh, mean temperatures around the world, and here's July mean temperatures. Uh, OK, so you've got the latitudinal control, also altitudinal control on uh, climate. So, for example, elevation is very much linked to temperature. So the higher we get up, uh, it gets colder. Uh, you can see that on mountains, on very high mountains. You can see uh, you know, the drop in temperature as you gain elevation. That's why very many, many high mountains, say sort of, sort of uh, you know, four or five thousand metres, ten thousand feet plus, you have often snow topped um, uh, due to the colder temperatures. Um, Elevation linked to temperature for the same latitude, um, uh, lower elevations are generally warmer and higher elevations are colder uh, for a specific um, elevation. Um, another control, proximity to water influences temperature, what's often called a maritime climate uh, close to the ocean or a continental climate away from the coast and ocean. So here it says the land heats and cools more rapidly uh, than water, uh, than ocean water. Um, so water, ocean water, in other words, because it doesn't heat or cool as rapidly, it sort of moderates. It has a kind of a, an averaging effect on climate near the coast, this maritime climate. So places near the ocean have less extremes for that reason. For, so, for example, here on this map, you can see the British Isles. They, they don't have very extreme winters or very extreme um, um, uh, um, summers in terms of temperature and snow, etc. But if you go to interior the continent, say of southern Germany or into eastern Europe, um, there's much a higher, much greater seasonality with uh, much higher um, extremes um, in those places. Um, ocean currents can influence temperature. Um, so that's another control on, on climate, on regional climate. So, for example, here we see on this on this uh, map on the left is the east coast of the United States. Um, that's kind of, as you can see, the red spot here is, is Long Island in New York, go down to Chesapeake Bay, Cape Hatteras there. And in the ocean, uh, these different colours are to, related to water temperature and the reds being warmer. And there's a large current which flows up. Uh, the east coast of America shoots off at Cape Hatteras in North Carolina, and then shoots off into the North Atlantic and carries on up to towards the uh, the north and the northeast Atlantic and northwest Europe, and it transfers huge amounts of heat. There's a large, you no, know, it's about a ten degree Celsius difference between these greens and the reds here, um, and that heat has been it basically it's circulating from the tropics, comes up the uh, east side of the Caribbean, then up the east side of the United States, and then off into the Atlantic and transfers that heat. And the, which changes the air temperature above it to northwest Europe and basically keeps northwest Europe uh, a lot warmer than it would be without this this uh, this current. It's called the Gulf Stream. It's a very important um, uh, ocean current in the uh, in the North Atlantic, and especially in terms of uh, regional climate. Um, so these 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 um these ocean currents which circulate all the ocean basins uh, often tra transfer heat. Um, away from the tropics or sometimes on the west side of the, of the ocean basin, but on the east side of the ocean basin, they often transfer cold water currents southwards, cooling the climate uh, in that case. Uh, mountains, mountain ranges can have a big influence on regional climate. Um, um, so, for example, uh, North America, um, so in the sort of mid latitudes, where you can see my, my cursor here, um, so the winds come from the west. They bring the precipitation with them, 
Uh, they reach the east, the west coast of America, and first there's a mountain range called the Coastal Range, and then there's this insane in California, and then the Sierra Nevada and the Rocky Mountains. So what happens there? The wind um, uh, has the air has to um, rise when it hits those 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 mountain barriers, and when you ever whenever you have rising air. Uh, you often have precipitation caused by that. That's why you have clouds, you know, a few thousand feet up. Uh, you have condensation, and then you get what's called the condensation level, and then precipitation. Uh, so basically, it rains. In this case, on the west side of those mountains, that air will continue to flow over the mountains, but now it's lost its moisture and will sink and become warmer on the far side. And you have deserts, and they're called rain shadow deserts on the leeward side of these mountains. So that's an, a common thing. Here they are in North America. That's why you have the, the, um, the deserts of the, um, the southwest of America, the Basin and Range region, um, and, and in other parts of the world where the, where the air flows over mountains like this. So they very much control these barriers, these physical barriers, uh, local climate. Uh, lastly, um, as a climate control, um, it says here proximity to semi-permanent high and low pressure cells. Um, so if you look at global circulation um, around the globe, it's, it can be divided into kind of three bands north and south of the equator called, um, it's not labeled here, they're called Hadley cells, H-A-D-L-E-Y. Um, and these Hadley cells are relating to sort of high and low pressure. So here you can see on the global map here, the blue area near the equator, and it calls it a rainforest belt, that's the very low pressure zone. And, and the stronger blues, and that's where you have, um, in this case, rising air, and the, the, the air is sucked in to replace that, the tra trade winds, and whenever you have riding, rising air, condensation at, at height, and precipitation, and that's why you have those rainforests going through the equator, the equatorial region of, say, the, uh, the, the Amazon rainforest of, of South America, etc. Um, other um, cells of, of um, um, high pressure, for example, in the desert belts, north and south of the equator, you get these it's desert zone, um, and that's due to sinking air, and sinking air is warming and drying and expanding, and you get very dry climate. So these belts, these basically equatorial forest belt, then to desert belts, they're very much related to these air pressure zones. So it's um, controls on climate again. All right, so there we've gone through a whole bunch of basically um, uh, regional and global uh, controls on climate as, as kind of a background. Um, okay, we're talking about now, we're going to move on to the atmosphere. And before we talk about global warming and whatnot, let's, let's see what the atmosphere is composed of and, and the important gases within it. Um, so air, um, it's a, the air in the atmosphere is a mixture of discrete gases. And the major components are, of clean air are nitrogen, is, is, uh, forms the highest uh, proportion of, of the atmosphere, 78%, uh, uh, which might be new to some of you. Um, uh, oxygen, which obviously we need, like uh, organisms need, um, is 21%. So they're the two big ones. I'll show you this on a pie chart in a second as well. Um, and other gases like argon, and also very in much smaller uh, percentages, uh, concentrations, you have gases like carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide or CO2 is only 0.036 of a percent or thereabouts. Uh, but it's a very important gas. You'd think it was much larger in, in you know, in, in um, abundance, but it's not. Um, but it's, it's very important because it absorbs heat energy radiating from the earth. And we'll come back to this point. It's what we call a greenhouse gas. Um, and these greenhouse gases uh, or what we call variable as well, that they can change over time. Some of these other ones are pretty much fixed, uh, nitrogen and oxygen, for example. Um, therefore, carbon dioxide influences the heating of the atmosphere because it can absorb heat energy radiating from Earth. And it's basically what's driving, especially CO2 and a few other greenhouse gases like um, methane. Um, it, it, it's driving current uh, global warming. Uh, I thought I'd show you a pie chart just to give, give you visually um, uh, the proportions of each of the gases. You can see nitrogen and oxygen are the two big uh, um, principal gases in the atmosphere. And then there's a whole host of other gases, but at much smaller percentages. Uh, for example, argon, but other things like um, helium, methane, uh, hydrogen, etc., and carbon dioxide. Um, so the composition of the atmosphere, you can think of those gases into two kind of brackets, two groups, um, 
Most of them in terms of volume are the permanent gases, the gases whose proportions stay constant. Uh, they have little effect atmospherically as far as climate, uh, oxygen and nitrogen or argon being examples. The variable gases, these are the ones whose proportions vary over time, and these play a very important role in atmospheric dynamics, especially as we see in, in, um, in terms of these greenhouse gases, uh, because they absorb, they have this ability to absorb heat. And these include um, carbon dioxide, uh, CO2, and methane, which is CH4, but also water vapor. Water vapor is actually the most abundant uh, greenhouse gas. We don't, we talk about CO2 mainly, uh, uh, and sometimes uh, methane, but not uh, water vapor. But because water vapor, we're not really changing human activity, isn't very much changing uh, the, the concentration of it in the atmosphere, but we are changing uh, the concentration of carbon dioxide and methane through our actions on it and activities. Um, so the greenhouse gases are the CH4, methane, and carbon dioxide CO2. So methane, after water vapor, it's the second most potent greenhouse gas uh, in terms of uh, the ability to absorb heat. It's more actually more potent by volume than, than CO2, but it exists in, in much lower concentrations. And it's got a considerably shorter residence time, only around, around about 10 years. Carbon dioxide, it's third most potent greenhouse gases, fluctuates seasonal, seasonally due to um, sort of a cycle of, um, of, of, of plants uh, drawing it in during um, photosynthesis uh, mainly, um, and then actually releasing it when say, the leaves are shed and, and there's decay, and, and, the, and the process of microbial decay releases carbon dioxide. So you get fluctuation of CO2 seasonally um, each year. Uh, but CO2 also has a much longer residence time, 50 to 200 plus years, uh, which is why, um, you know, we, we, we're, we're, especially in part two of these lectures, we'll be talking about um, if we can, you know, proje projections for the future, can we change climate change by reducing our emissions of, uh, of greenhouse gases um, into the atmosphere? It, there's going to be a long lag time for CO2. It's going to take a while for that gradually to take effect, you know, even after we, after we lower emissions um, and to actually change the CO2 volume in the atmosphere. Um, all right, um, just briefly aside here as well, the thermal structure of the atmosphere. Um, so if you go, if you do it on the left here, you can see a mountain, uh, this one in the tropics, but still as you go up into elevation, even though it's in the tropics, um, it's cold. And it might be very warm uh, at low elevation, but it gets cold the higher you go up. You can see the snow top peaks on the left. Um, on the right, the chart shows changes um, in temperature, the red line, as you go up through the atmosphere, right through the atmosphere, right into space. So where weather is concentrated, clouds, etc., cetera, they're, they're contained really in what, there's a layer, uh, what we call uh, the troposphere. And the troposphere is the, the, the lower sort of 10 kilometers of, um, it's around about seven miles of the Earth's atmosphere. And in this zone, you'll see the red line gets increases um, or actually decreases, it goes from right to left, so to colder temperatures. So temperatures decrease with altitude, which you're familiar with. The higher you go up on a mountain, it gets colder. But then above that layer, we go into the next layer of the atmosphere, it's called the stratosphere. And here we see temperatures actually rise as you go up through the stratosphere. Then you go for another layer, the mesosphere, and temperatures decrease again, and then the thermosphere, uh, they increase. But we're really we're only going to be concerned with the troposphere. Um, in our look at the, the atmosphere. Uh, the thing at the, the top, by the way, the um, auroras, uh, these are often called the, the northern lights, the aurora borealis in the northern hemisphere, or the southern lights, the aurora australis, in, uh, I believe it's called, in, in the southern hemisphere. Uh, so the borealis in the northern and australis in the southern. Um, and you see these, that's shimmering, swirling lights in the cloud, and that's basically um, ions, charged particles coming from the sun uh, hitting our magnetic field, essentially, uh, and causing that display. Um, you only really see it mainly in the very high latitudes towards the poles, or, or most notably. Okay, so um, with the atmosphere, and this is going to lead on to uh, the greenhouse effect, let's talk about atmospheric heated. How is our planet heated, first of all? Um, well, first of all, let's think about how the mechanisms of heat transfer so heat is always transferred from warmer to cooler objects. So, um, so let's think of here, we have a, a heat source, a fire, 
an open fire and someone's holding a, a you know, metal pot of, of water above it. And the, the three mechanisms of heat sources is labeled conduction, convection and radiation. So conduction is a transfer of heat through, through matter, through a solid by molecular activity. Convection, it's a mass movement or circulation, circulation within a substance, so within a liquid. And then there's radiation or, or, or electromagnetic radiation. This is the transfer by ele electromagnetic waves. And this is the mechanism by which solar energy reaches the Earth, a process called insulation. So, the, um, so insulation or, the, or solar energy reaching Earth, it comes through the vacuum of space. Well, convection and conduction can't transfer heat through a vacuum. Therefore, it comes to us through this process called um, radiation as part of electromagnetic waves. Uh, they travel to us essentially at the speed of light, which is what this velocity here is, uh, 300,000 kilometers per second or 186,000 miles per second in a vacuum. That's, that's the speed of light um, as part of the the, um, the like electromagnetic spectrum, essentially. So this energy reaches Earth um, as a visible spectrum and also as um, the ultraviolet, especially. So shortwave radiation, what we call. So the, the visible and the ultraviolet. Uh, that's that's where this incoming solar radiation comes into our planet. Uh, note on this scale, if you go into the long wave radiation, the first um, section is called infrared. We'll come back to that, that type of radiation. Um, so with incoming uh, radiation um, and uh, on the visible spectrum, um, rainbows here, you can see that full spectrum, and these are produced by the bending and reflection of light by, light by drops of water. So if you've got a lot of Water moisture and droplets, condensed water uh, particles in the in the basically sort of low fog in the atmosphere. Uh, as this uh, light um, 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 flows through that, it's reflected, and hence you get the spectrum shown. Okay, going back to incoming solar radiation, what happens to it when it comes through our atmosphere and, and to the ground? So the atmosphere is largely largely transparent to the incoming solar radiation um, but some is absorbed or reflected and this diagram on the right shows that some is absorbed or reflected um, um, by the atmosphere it's either absorbed by clouds or simply reflected back into space you can see 30 percent lost to space by reflection and scattering for example um, and this percentage reflected, so a percentage value, it's called the albedo. It's quite an important uh, property. So the percentage reflectance, it's called the albedo value. It's given as a percentage. Um, so most visible radiation uh, reaches the surface. And about 50% basically is then absorbed at the Earth's Earth surface. So 50% of that incoming um, solar radiation is absorbed by the ground. Uh, before we continue the story, let's go back to um, the albedo, the re reflectivity, and just a note on um, color really comes into play, the color of the surface, be it light or dark, into, into the albedo value. So in general, light colored surfaces tend to be more reflective than dark colored surfaces, and thus have higher albedo values. So for example, here you can see this white, ro white roofed building, um, 35 to 50%, while some, a building with, with, with um, dark roof is 10 to 15%. Which is why in you know, places like you know, Southwest of America, Central America, Mexico, or Spain in Europe, uh, many of the buildings are all whitewashed. Why? Because that, off that, will, that will help uh, reflect the heat and keep you know, the interior of that building uh, cooler. So it's for a reason. Um, darker roofs would absorb more heat. Uh, and you can see on things like snow, uh, lighter coloured materials on the ground, it's 50 to 90 percent. Um, and that's actually, we'll come back in part two, we might, may mention that, um, that affects uh, climate when ice sheets are bigger, they'll actually reflect more the incoming solar radiation and therefore um, the temperature can, can often get uh, colder in that case for, for that reason. Um, Okay, going back to the incoming uh, solar radiation. So some some of that is then so the heat the ground uh, warms up, but then it re radiates radiation is what we call terrestrial radiation um, at the longer wavelengths at the in the infrared part of the spectrum. So um, this longer wavelength ra terrestrial radiation is, is absorbed 
by certain gases, by greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, things like carbon dioxide and water vapour. Um, so it's absorbed by those gases, which hold onto it, and then actually then re-radiate it within the atmospheric uh, layer. And so the lower the net result is the lower atmosphere is heated from the Earth's surface. And the heating of the atmosphere is termed the greenhouse effect. So it's basically, so you have incoming solar radiation, about 50% absorbed by the ground, and a lot of that, that's then re-radiated out um, as longer wavelength radiation in the infrared part of the spectrum. And that infrared uh, long wave radiation is then absorbed on its way out to space, some of it by um, greenhouse gases like carbon dioxide and methane and water vapor. Therefore, if you have more greenhouse gases, more heat is going to be trapped in the atmosphere. And that is the greenhouse effect and, and global warming. Um, so here to show that in the diagram again, here you see the incoming short wave radiation. It's uh, re-radiated as this longer uh, wavelength radiation, infrared generally, and then it's trapped by, it's absorbed by these um, greenhouse gases like CO2 and water vapor. Uh, and then these greenhouse gases in turn re-radiate some of that energy earthwards and within the atmosphere and basically warm the atmosphere um, and the planet gets warmer. Here, yeah, just showing the same thing. And so I put this in again so you can see the whole picture sort of globally um, as a planet. Uh, you have the long wave radiation. A lot of it's re reflected straight off the atmosphere at the top from clouds. Some of it will get to the Earth though, then it's re radiated here in the blue uh, out outwards, and then that's trapped by greenhouse gases, which kind of keep that heat within the atmosphere and cause the greenhouse effect. So, how do you increase temperature? Well, you increase the concentrations of the greenhouse gases, these very important gases um, like carbon dioxide. Humans have a significant influence on those concentrations now from our activities. For example, in the background here, you can see two chimneys from a power plant. You can see them emitting all, you know, the pollution in terms of particulates, etc., um, basically which will cause pollution. But also they're emitting huge amounts of carbon. You won't see it here, invisible carbon dioxide, a major greenhouse gas. And since the industri industrial revolution, essentially, of the 1900s, and that really took place, play, uh, accelerated in the 20th century when more and more countries around the, around the world were, were getting into that industrialized phase. Um, we've seen huge increases in, in carbon dioxide uh, being pumped into the atmosphere from directly from human activity, in this case, kind of industrialization and energy production, directly from the burning of fossil fuels, because that's how these, these um, gases are being produced. So in coal-fired power plants, for example, coal-fired power stations, they burn coal to produce uh, produce energy, produce electricity. Um, but in that process, in that burning process, huge amounts of carbon dioxide are released. Um, so we're artificially creating huge amounts of CO2 and, and, and inputting that into our atmosphere. And that is changing climate. Categorically, it is. It's changing climate globally um, by increasing the amount of those heat absorbing uh, green, uh, greenhouse gases in our atmosphere, especially CO2. Um, so here, talking about, so burning fossil fuels is something we're now, now that the kind of everyone's really cottoned on to that fact, and now we're seeing the detrimental effects of, of climate change, such as droughts, such as wildfires, such as sea level rise, um, and such as increased storms. Um, we realize we're going to have to become less dependent as a globe, uh, as, as independent nations, on fossil fuels. Uh, as an energy source, we just have to. Um, so here you can see uh, the burning of fossil fuels at great quantity of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. This graph shows energy consumption in the United States in 2008, so it's a little while ago. Uh, and there's been gradual move from that away, not a huge amount, but it's in the right direction. So here you can see coal is used, uh, energy consumption a lot, 23%, natural gas, petroleum, nuclear power. So petroleum, natural gas, coal, all fossil fuels, all of them, when you use them in energy, will produce carbon dioxide uh, um, and therefore uh, uh, contribute towards global warming. The key is to use either nuclear power, uh, that does have its issues because uh, of safety and what to do with it, you know, nuclear waste, etc. Uh, but also mainly that the best way to go along is renewable energy. Uh, back in this, when this chart was produced in uh, 2008, it was 7% 
of um, total energy consumption in the US and the, and the pie chart on the right kind of breaks that down uh, into the different types of renewable energy, for example, biomass, um, hydroelectric. Hydroelectric is basically as much as we can get at in many countries of the world. By It's basically by damming rivers and then you can produce um, electricity in big turbines from uh, releasing that uh, water in a controlled manner through the dam and through turbines. Um, all the major rivers in the United States, for example, have been dammed um, and they have a light hydroelectric power kind of, um, uh, generators installed. And so it's the other things which you can increase, especially some of these narrow, smaller wedges here back in 2008, um, such as wind and solar. Geothermal is a big issue. And is it is an important contributor in some areas of the world, small contribu contributor in the United States. In some countries like Iceland, they get most of their energy from geothermal energy. Why? Because they're stuck right on top of a divergent plate boundary where there's lots of magma coming up, magma generation, just quite a very shallow depth. Therefore, you can plug into that essentially and, and produce heat. Uh, you can only do that in very specific places near plate boundaries, for example. Um, but wind energy and solar energy is very much increasing. So this, um, so just to step out and to look at renewables just for one second before we go back into uh, you know what produces greenhouse gases like burning fossil fuels. Uh, the next slide shows um, renewable energy consumption in the United States, uh, fast forwarding to 2019. And here it's gone up from 7% of a total US energy consumption to 11%. So um, the renewable section sector is increasing. Uh, but just to note, in some other parts of the world, it, it, it's actually increased uh, very substantially. For example, uh, in the European Union as a whole, now the 2020 figures were 20% of total energy consumption is, is, uh, is provided for by renewable energy. And in some countries within the European Union, like Sweden, it's at 56%, or Denmark, 37% of their energy is produced by, by renewables. Um, um, <clears throat> so this, going back to the, the slide uh, on the screen here, um, this chart breaks down within the new renewables for the US, the different sources of those renewables. So you can see wind, which on the, the previous chart was a very smaller uh, percentage of renewables. Um, here it's gone up to, in the last sort of decade, to 24%, so about a quarter of renewable energy in the United States is now produced by wind turbines. And you'll see that increase globally. That's where a lot of, uh, currently, where a lot of the increase in energy production is for renewables is by wind. So we're seeing why, because they're becoming much more economically viable to build very large turbines. We're talking a couple of hundred feet, these huge turbines. And many of them are often placed offshore now to get the, uh, the most constant wind. Uh, and you can make the structures very, very big offshore. And now we're even talking about there's pilot studies in places like the uh, North, um, the Northern United Kingdom, for example, they've got pilot study in the Shetland Islands there. I know there's pilot studies in the United States um, to, to make these commercial floating wind turbines. So instead of the big offshore ones being anchored to the seabed as they currently are, if you can actually float these turbines, uh, you know, um, you will be able to produce huge amounts of uh, wind energy in the future. But also, solar energy is on the increase. Um, biomass is also increasing. This chart also shows what that energy is used for. For example, um, electric power in the US is mainly for renewables is provided by wind energy and hydro and solar. Uh, biofuels, a lot of that goes into transportation, for example. Going back to um, um, uh, greenhouse gases. So we, we said um, burning of fossil fuels, that's one of the big players, uh, the big bad guys, if you will, in, in um, increasing the amount of uh, fossil fuels, sorry, greenhouse gases. Another huge section of, or the, of contributor to greenhouse gases is the process of deforestation. So the clearing of um, tropical rainforest. So this is happening still at a dreadful rate still, unfortunately, even though we know the consequences in places like the, the Amazon rainforest of Brazil, uh, the rainforest of places like Indonesia, but especially at the moment, um, over the last 10 years, it's still, at, at some rate, it's still continuing this process of deforestation. But this process, as well as the destruction of habitat, you know, and, and, and in, in, incurrence on, on, on indigenous peoples, etc., um, it's causing and the loss of biodiversity, which is awful, but um, it's also putting a huge amount of CO2 in the atmosphere, basically um, the process of slash and burn, as it's called, so you're burning Yes, you take away a lot of that, that timber, and you can use that timber, that lumber, uh, but also then you burn the vegetation, 
that produces a large amount of CO2. And then all the, the foliage, the smaller twigs and leaves, if you will, they just rot in place. And the process of micro, microbial de decay produces carbon dioxide in very large amounts. So basically deforestation will produce huge amounts of CO2 as it's burned or decays. Um, all right, so all the CO2, let's just look at some charts to show the increase uh, with time um, that these activities of burning of fossil fuels, deforestation, et cetera, are doing. Uh, so carbon dioxide, you can see very much increasing. So here are these, these graphs, uh, the, 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 top, the larger three ones, are going from 1,000 years ago on the left to the year 2000 on the right. Um, and here you can see a sudden increase from sort of through the 1900s, especially into the 20th century. So it's good for CO2 since the Industrial Revolution, industrialization, and then the establishment of, of power stations, etc. Um, and very much a dependence through the 20th century on fossil fuels as an energy source and a huge amounts of increase of CO2 in the atmosphere. So all these are changes in the world's atmospheres. Uh, methane on the bottom left increasing, another greenhouse gas called nitrous oxide increasing. Going back to methane, that's increasing for some other reasons, uh, which I haven't touched on. Um, livestock, cows in particular, um, produce huge amounts of methane, of significant contributors of methane um, um, due to, uh, as part of, you know, pop, um, as organisms, and especially as these group of organisms called ruminants. Um, so they, they give off a lot of methane and um, therefore if you have more livestock, more cows, more methane. And out the world's, the world's climate, sorry, the world's population is still increasing at a huge rate. More people on our planet, more people to feed, therefore more livestock needed, therefore more methane being produced. So because of global uh, ballooning in, increases in population growth, uh, especially in the developing world, we're seeing a large increase in methane because of that. Also, methane is produced by things like um, paddy fields in rice production. Uh, so the decay process in those fields, those waterlogged fields of, 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 um, of rice fields, that produces also a big source of methane so in, in the cultivation of rice. So what we can do about that, I, might, I may touch on this in, in, in the second lecture, uh, we can basically become more of a plant-based diet uh, society, or uh, maybe not go completely vegan or vegetarian, but simply less reliance on meat and, their, and livestock, therefore. And also we can change our cultivation methods for things like rice production, and we can do things, that is possible. Okay, um, so that relates to um, uh, increases and decreases in uh, carbon dioxide, natural variation. And you'll see there's a peak in CO2, uh, about every 100,000 years. So we're going back from the year zero, current on the right, back to um, 400,000 years on the left. And so every 100,000 years, you have a peak uh, in CO2. And that actually relates to a natural cycle that's gone on for the, certainly the last sort of 2 million years or so, which is a glacial and interglacial cycle. So basically there's been many ice ages, a whole sequence of ice ages over the last 2 million years. And roughly there's basically an ice age every every um, 100,000 years. So the troughs are actually the cold ice ages and the peaks are what we call interglacials and we're currently actually within an interglacial, typically lasts between sort of sort of around about 10,000 years, 10 to 20,000 years is the typical length of an interglacial. We're about 10,000 years in, so we're about halfway through an interglacial. So an inter theoretically, if we follow this thing, uh, in about another 10,000 years time, we're going to go back into another ice age and that probably will happen. Uh, the, the, the planet will cool again. And in lecture two, I'll go into the reasons for that, what's driving that, uh, to do with the orbit of the Earth uh, around the sun and how that sun-Earth uh, distance actually changes on a very slightly on a 100,000 year so cycle. And when we're further away, the climate is cooler. When we're, when we're closer, when we're orbiting at a closer distance, the climate is warmer. So it's on a very long time cycle. Um, so that's what's driving these, these that natural variation. But you see the peaks in the, the warm period, the interglacial, don't, never gets over 300 parts per million CO2 concentrations. Never got to happen. And, and you actually can take this chart further back, um, certainly around about sort of 700,000 years. Um, these are derived, by the way, from ice core records, which we'll come back to. Uh, basically, it's looking at fossil atmosphere trapped as ice bubbles in, in ice, core, ice core records. 
from the Antarctic ice sheet, especially, but also from the Greenland ice sheet. Um, so, uh, but we'll come back to that. Um, here you can see recent changes and suddenly an anomaly to the difference uh, in that CO2 levels are, are just keep on going up over the last century. So here you can see they're rising through the uh, the late latter part last sort of, uh, century, and then since around about 1950, you've just been at a very high rate um, increasing the amount of CO2. So here it is in 2008. It peaked uh, the 400 parts per million back in 2014, 2015, and and in 2021, it's it's at um, 4,017 parts per million. So it's increased to 4,017. Um, so here on this scale, um, in 2021. So if I put where that is on here, that we're about here in 2021. So it's increasing, onward increase. Um, so the rapid increase in CO2 since the onset of the Industrial Revolution. So that tells you it's definitely not natural variation, basically, first off. Something's happening to the world which is not, which is breaking away from that natural rise and fall of CO2 over long time scales, and it's human activity. We are changing the amount of gases in the atmosphere directly from uh, burning of fossil fuels from deforestation and, and other sources. But those two, those are the main ones. Converting that source of CO2 into temperature on a smaller time scale now, you can directly convert it into temperatures. Uh, so here's annual average global temperature variations for the period 1850 on the left to, in this case, 2008 on the right. Uh, and the basis for comparison where that horizontal line is, is the average for the 1961 to 1990 period. So we, we compare it to that period. And it was pretty much around about the same for the 1800s. Um, it, it's the temperature then started to increase um, the early part of the 20th century, then plateaued for a while. And then since around sort of the 1960s, it's been steadily increasing. If, if we carried this chart to about, you know, forward to 2020 or so, you'd see a steady increase as well of temperature. So there's definite global warming taking place, and it's been certainly going on for the last sort of 70 years at least um, at, at quite some rate. So here it's, the title of this, by the way, is anthropogenic changes, and anthropogenic basically means human-induced uh, changes. And we're definitely in, in causing global warming. It is human activity. It's not part of a natural variation. This is human activity, which is causing the current um, increases in temperature. Um, why? Uh, it's also to do with greenhouse gases. So CO2 in the atmosphere steadily climbed since 1958. Uh, and the chart in the bottom left shows that. Uh, direct, we've de uh, measured it directly in places like Hawaii, but other places in the world now as well. And um, we've basically been directly monitoring and recording CO2 year on year, constantly since uh, 1958. And you can see it just steadily, gradually, inexorably increases. <laughs> it's not going down. And it's actually the, the, the gradient of that line is getting slightly steeper. So in other words, the rate of change is actually is starting to get um, more rapid. Um, this natural, by the way, up and down of this curve, you get this every year, you get that up and down curve. That's essentially almost like the planet breathing in and out. So it's breathing in and out every year. And basically what's happening, if you look at the little chart inside that graph, it's to do with um, plants. Um, and if you look at the configuration of the, of the continents um, on Earth, most of the continents are in the Northern Hemisphere and most of the vegetation is in the Northern Hemisphere. So what this chart is showing is that there's a decrease in carbon dioxide from the spring and through the summer, basically through the growing season, as plants photosynthesize and breathe in carbon dioxide as part of photosynthesis. Then when that, that growing season finishes, when you get into the autumn and winter, and the leaves fall off deciduous trees, et cetera, and off shrubs, um, all that uh, leaf fall, et cetera, will start to decay, and you have the, the generation of CO2 from microbial decay and the release of CO2. It breathes out uh, nature, if you will, during the autumn and winter. So that's breathing in, breathing out. That's why you have this up and down um, uh, variation every year. But the trend, it's all about trends, uh, on uh, every year um, is onwards and upwards for carbon dioxide. And here, 2010, it was below the 400 parts per million. Now, as I say, um, 2021, here, uh, I put it on here, it's 416 parts per million. So the in human in additions of these greenhouse gases, CO2 and CH4, which is methane, exceeds 
natural removals. Therefore, the concentrations are getting higher with time. Um, fossil fuel combustion is introducing huge amounts of CO2. Rice paddy decay is, is producing huge amounts of methane. Cow flatulence is producing huge amounts of, com, uh, of uh, methane as well, especially that's increasing. Uh, the last one because of the increase in the amount of livestock on, on the planet due to the population rise. Um, and again, the bottom one showed again, basically the last slide, uh, uh, repeating that, but showing um, natural variations in CO2, the increase um, to around about 2001 here, and then um, projected changes. And we'll come back to that about um, projections of CO2 over the next century in um, part two of these lectures. Uh, so anthropogenic change over the last century, since 1920, global temperature has been increasing, very much so. Uh, and the, the 1900s warming has reversed a thousand year cooling trend. So the 20th century warming is, we, we basically reversed what, what had been happening naturally for the pre previous thousand years. So we can see on the chart on the left, this is temperature um, uh, with time from, um, and this is calendar years, so from um, uh, year 0 AD to 2000 AD, the calendar years on the right, so current day, or sort of just off the chart, 2004 here it shows. Um, and you can see there was a rise in temperature, there was a warm period, what we call the medieval warm period in Europe, certainly, um, around about sort of um, 800 to sort of 1200 AD, there was a warm period in, in climate. And I'll come back to that, that's where uh, there's, there's records of, of Vikings, etc., and, and colonizing. Greenland's during that warm period, so around 1800, 1900, 1000 AD, uh, you know, and, and there are actually there's records of in Greenland um, of vines, you know, which you couldn't in today's climate during that that warm period at the time. Then there was a period of cooling, and again in the North Atlantic region, which is often called the Little Ice Age, a uh, period of, of, of global cooling, um, culminated around about 1600 to 1800 in, in the Little Ice Age, as I say. But since the Industrial Revolution, we've reversed that, 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 that period of a thousand years of cooling, and now it's warming uh, because of uh, human activity, essentially. And you can see that one of the first big red flags, if you will, when people, observers of the world saw was the retreat of mountain glaciers uh, worldwide. And here you can see an image, two photographs taken in 1941, top right, the bottom right, in 2004, of the same place of the Muir Glacier in Alaska, taken 63 years apart, same vantage point, someone took a camera, went back to the same spot, that, uh, the photo of 1941, came back in 2004, and the glacier's gone, it's retreated, out of view, the main glacier, and there's a side one, you can just see a part of it uh, um, retreating up the side valley here. And this is happening to glaciers, mountain glaciers, and in fjords, um, all, all around the world, these mountain glaciers are, are in retreat. So 95% of mountain glaciers are retreating, be, be they in the Himalayan mountains, be they in Alaska, uh, be they in the Alps, etc. And why? Uh, in this case, it's warmer air temperatures and they're retreating to higher elevations. Okay, so the last part of these lectures I'm going to go through now are study the past climate change. How, how do we look at um, to get that natural variation? Um, so for this, the last part of this lecture, we're going to go through different methods of reconstructing uh, the past climate. And then we can use that to look at the future and see sort of changes. How, how does current, current and projected changes compare to natural variation, which is a very important point. So over the past three million years, Earth's climate system has fluctuated greatly and alternated between periods of glaciation and, and, and non-glaciation. So that's just kind of background. You have to keep that, that so 100,000 year cycle of, gla of, gla of ice age or glacial stage, then interglacial, then glacial, then interglacial, etc. Uh, on a long time period. Okay, so data available for, uh, for reconstructing climate comes from three main sources. Firstly, on the short scale instrumental records, basically from the last century or, or less, the last few decades in, in some cases. So actually, actually recording carbon dioxide level since 1958, actually, you know, physically recording that, uh, or physically recording temperature data. Historical records, so documented um, cases um, of, of climate change. Uh, next, and then the third bracket of, of data comes from paleo proxy records. So uh, proxies are things which change but reflect climate change, like tree rings, for example. And we'll look at those different, and, and from those you can infer 
changes in climate, like infer changes in temperature, or you infer changes in, in uh, precipitation, uh, dry or wet periods, for example. Um, so, firstly, instrumental records, measurements of temperature made directly since 1860, for example, we've directly measured, been a constant record since 1860, so we have a great record at, since that point of, of temperature changes. CO2 measurements have been made from 1960, or actually from 1958. Um, also other things like solar energy has been measured from the past several decades. So here's a graph which shows uh, mean kind of annual temperature, which has been recorded ever since um, the 1860, in this case 1880 on this graph. And um, you can see the gradual, yes, there's some variation of ups, ups and downs over the years and the decades, but the total positive trend of increasing temperatures uh, with time. And round about, you can see sort of between the year 2000 or 2010, say, uh, we're at 0.8 here, and let's take the century, uh, minus four. So over, over a whole degree Celsius, over a, over a century, basically. basically. A one degree Celsius rise, that's a lot. Um, but we'll see next part, we're talking about two or three degrees Celsius, or even four degrees Celsius over the next century. So it's really increasing that rate, um, unless we, we hold that back uh, by changing the amount of um, uh, emissions of, of, of CO2, especially into the atmosphere. Other things we can direct, directly measure in the instrumental records are sea level change. Um, so here on the, on the left is um, records of changes in mean sea level for an area from uh, this case, so it's all, sort of from sort of 1990 through to year 2005, and you can see there's an increase in sea level, um, and there is globally uh, due to the melting of ice sheets, the melting of mountain glaciers uh, due to rising sea levels, also to something called thermal expansion. Uh, the air is getting, and, and the ocean water is getting warmer, and as things get warm, they expand, and that is also causing um, sea level rise. So a combination of thermal expansion, expansion uh, and glacier uh, melting and ice sheet melting is causing sea levels globally to rise. And in areas with low lying, you know, low level, a small gradient, to, uh, so basically coastal plains uh, small, with a small gradient um, on that area, they, they show a large substantial shift in the shoreline um, over time. Um, not so much on areas of steep, a steep uh, gradient on that shoreline, there'll be a less, um, a smaller shoreline shift, as you can see. Um, the next uh, group of data is from historical records, so which includes books, newspapers, journal articles, personal his journals, etc. Basically, like I said, the, the key word historical here for historical records. So this historical recorded history uh, can show you the fact there was agriculture at one point in what is now the Sahara. Um, so it's, uh, so um, it shows it was wetter at some stage of Earth's history. The colonization of Greenland during the medieval warm period, for example. Wheat farming in Norway during that same period, uh, flooding in Scandinavia during, especially during the, the Little Ice Age, extensive alpine glaciers expanding during the Little Ice Age. Um, so you see these natural changes in temperature, and these basically either be, uh, you know, the colonization, colonization of Greenland, uh, and in, in Norway, that's to do with the, the medieval warm period, so rises in temperature, or decreases in temperature, and the, you know, the, the um, um, the expansion of alpine glaciers, the predicted changes for the next century are much greater than those temperature sh shifts that are caused that cause these events. So the events that are listed on this slide. So the events that are listed uh, um, on this slide um, um, are, are are basically from natural variation, natural climate variation. The predicted changes from basically anthropogenic change are much bigger. The temperature shifts are going to be much, much bigger um, than these ones that we've seen in the past, which is something to be concerned about. Here you can see that same chart I showed earlier, uh, just, just in more detail, so you can look at it here. You can see the temperature, natural variation, uh, the historic record. You can see the uh, medieval warm period, around right about 1,000 years ago, and then sort of a couple of centuries back, we were in the, the grips of the Little Ice Age. And now in the last century, we're increasing temperatures uh, caused by human basically an increasing amount of greenhouse gas in the atmosphere. Okay, finally, I'm going to go through different paleoproxy records. Um, 
and I can see that this this particular climate change lecture one is going to be over the hour. I'm going to, I'll try and keep because I've, I've still got a little little to get through. Um, I'll try and keep uh, climate change lecture two uh, less than an hour. I, as you know, I like to keep a lecture to around about an hour. This one's going to be a little bit more. I think we've got about another ten minutes to go. Um, so paleo proxy records data can be uh, says here can be um, correlated uh, with climate. So data in, in these records, data are not a direct measurement of temperature. Uh, they're basically proxy records. They provide the best evidence that predates the historic and instrumental records. And I'll show you a whole list of examples of these sort of proxy records. Um, so on this slide, and then we'll take some of these in a bit more detail on each to finish off. So first of all, tree ring records. Uh, so tree ring records go back uh, um, sort of nine, ten thousand years, even even eleven to thirteen thousand years in some cases. Uh, and what do tree rings show? Uh, if you, you know you slice through it for a large tree, you'll see the annual growth rings. And um, these rings are the width of the rings. Individual rings indicate uh, warm, dry years versus cold, wet years. And we'll go. We'll, I'll show you an example of that in a second. Um, and so, you can, in other words, you can see. Uh, they, they they infer uh, both both temperature and precipitation levels from these tree ring records. Uh, it's called dendrochronology. Um, these records. Um, deep sea sediment cores are also sources of uh, proxy climate data, and these go back several hundred thousand years from from sediment on the seabed and the ocean basins, especially under the seas like the Red Sea. And um, here the, you look at data such as uh, the differences in in microfossil content, types of species, um, and something called the oxygen isotope record in microfossils. Again, I'll come back to this, this, sort of, this what that means. Um, ice core records, ice cores go back several hundred thousand years, uh, but they go back around about um, 700,000 years from the Greenland ice core. Uh, basically, they, they took ice cores right through the Greenland ice sheet, and they've also took ice cores right through the Antarctic ice sheet, and that goes back around over a million years. So about 1.2 million years, it's thicker. And as you go down through those ice cores, you're going basically back in time. And as the as the snow accumulated into ice over time and, and built up these big ice sheets, which can be a mile thick in Greenland, three miles thick in sort of five kilometers thick in in, uh, in Antarctica. Um, and within those ice <coughs> sorry ice cores, they're trapping uh, air bubbles year on year, and they're basically fossil fossilized bubbles of of atmosphere from the past. So you can you can uh, extract those air bubbles and you can measure directly the amount of CO two in the atmosphere, um, as a concentration of, of of you know of the of the former atmosphere. Uh, you can also determine the composition of the water and that will also give you um, a hint of the uh, temperatures and um, in, in the past. Glacial deposits go back sort of a two million years. Basically, as the ice as, as we treat in an advanced um, each glacial interglacial phase uh, state, uh, cycle. Uh, you have the deposits laid down by um, ice sheets and then then eroded back. Then new deposits are eroded um, are, 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 are laid down with, with each successive ice age. And again, I'll mention that in the second lecture, not so much today. Um, and fossils, well, fossils go back, you know, former, uh, you know, traces of former life, which are what fossils are, uh, be they the hard parts of skeletons of organisms, the shells of organisms. But once you know what sort of um, climate um, these animals are associated with, they can therefore infer climate in the rocks they're found in, and they go back 540 million years. <laughs> um, and lastly, this spilled onto a different slide, pollen, just as one example of, a, of an organism relating to sort of tree pollen, for example, and grass pollen, so pollen from, from plants. Uh, these will collect in the environment, and the type and abundance of pollen they reflect different types of different plant groups, be they trees or grasses or different specific species, those can reflect climate once you know what sort of climate um, those, those different plants live, live in, represent. Um, giving you background, uh, this shows you um, the whole of geologic history, um, uh, geologic time period on the, on the right, but it just shows you, I wanted to show you that, that there have been, uh, we're mainly going to concentrate on the very top of this chart, uh, you know, the last basically few thousand years, the very top slither, and maybe with interglacial and glacial periods, the last kind of two million years. But if you go back into the deep time, the geologic time, uh, you'll see here cold and warm periods, mean global temperature over, say, the last uh, last 500 million years, 
the quaternary right through the Cambrian, which is basically as, as long as they've been, that's the record of multicellular life of animals and plants. Uh, before that, there were single celled organisms etc going back way back um, sort of three three and four billion years and here you can see right at the bottom uh, 4,600 million years so that's 4.6 billion years the age of the earth um, but you can see there's been various um, ice ages or cold periods so the current Pleistocene were part of you know, that current period of cold and warm um, cycle in in the current Pleistocene um, over sort of one one point eight billion over the current quaternary period but there also were other other uh, cold periods. For example, there was an ice age, a major ice age in the late Carboniferous. There was a, a major one in the late Ordovician, a very significant one in the late Proterozoic, around about uh, so 800 million years ago, uh, where possibly the whole Earth was actually covered in ice. That's what we call an ice ball Earth hypothesis. Probably not completely. We think there was open water um, in the equators, but anyway, that's a different different lecture. Um, and also well, there were warm periods. For example, the warmest period in, in Earth, Earth history, we think, was during the early Cretaceous uh, period. We think that, why? We think there was a lot of volcanic activity at that time. Therefore, volcanoes also produced, uh, produced a lot of CO2. Therefore, CO2 levels were very uh, high during that period. All right, that's kind of deep time geology. Let's come back to more the last few thousand years and the different kind of records we, we use to, to reconstruct time over the last few thousand years. Pollen being one. So pollen will collect in the environment and the types and abundance of pollen, pollen because pollen is produced by plants, you know, dispersal, dispersal uh, of plants uh, in part of their reproductive uh, system. Um, and they will um, reflect the climate, you know, different plants grow in cold climate as opposed to different trees or plants, etc. Different types of plant growing in warm climate. Um, so, for example, um, grasses generally represent colder, drier climate, while trees, so things kind of tundra and prairie sort of tundra black grasses, trees generally represent warmer and wetter climate. So on the far right, and you've looked at the slides, because I think on, on this view, you can see me in a way, but if you look at the slides, you'll see that um, there's changes over time going back over the last 800,000 years here, or eight, the last, last 90,000 years on this chart, it'll show you. And it'll show you basically there's a peak in the brown, which is tree pollen over the last 10,000 years, which is the last interglacial, the current interglacial, what we call the Holocene. So it's been lots of trees, so it's been warmer. Uh, but then during the last ice age, there weren't many trees, but there were great plains of grass and tundra. So you'll see lots of grass uh, during the colder, um, drier ice age. And then the bottom of this chart behind me, if you will, um, is another peak, which is the last interglacial, which was sort of 80, 90,000 years, the end of it, um, um, which shows uh, more trees back then. Also on the left, the charts show the migration of, of plants in this case um, with, um, with climate. So here you can see the belt of spruce trees, which, um, which is a, a, a cold um, loving uh, tree, um, but it was further south. Uh, so into sort of the middle part of the United States, uh, into, you know, south towards almost Virginia, for example, on the east coast of America. And that was because of the colder climate at that time. Fast forward to today, spruce doesn't live down that far south. It, it, it likes the colder climate of northern Canada, basically. So this migration and change variability in species location of plants reflects climate, which is why pollen is a great proxy for climate, basically, in area. Tree rings, gross tree rings can easily be dated. Uh, you can date them through radiocarbon dating, organic material. And then for, you can directly relate those dates to um, uh, the widths of the tree, uh, tree rings. Uh, and those widths are indicating thicker uh, rings are indicating wetter, warmer periods and thinner rings are representing drier, colder periods. And you can use many trees. You don't just need very long lived trees. I mean, the longest lived trees uh, live in places like the bristle cone pine tree. So the bristle cone pine lives in places like the southwest um, sort of desert part of the United States and into Mexico. Um, and they can actually, they're the longest living trees, 9,000 years old. Uh, but you don't need to destroy, you know, to poke holes in a bristle cone pine tree. You can use lots of overlapping um, tree records from shorter lived species like oaks, etc. 
um, which may live. I mean, oaks themselves can still live, you know, many, many centuries like an oak tree. But you can go back in time using successive trees if you find fossilized um, oaks, for example. And these overlapping time ranges will give you a longer chronology. And the tree ring, the dendrochronology, goes back to around about 13,000 years. We, know, we have a record of. Um, ice core records, like I said, you can take these ice cores and it shows them on these slides, taking them um, from Greenland in this case, uh, but they're from Antarctica and Greenland, these two big ice sheets on Earth. And basically the, we've, we've taken ice cores right to the bottom of those, those ice sheets, uh, brought them back up and analyzed them for um, uh, trapped gases within them, such as carbon dioxide. Uh, here you have that carbon CO2 record directly from ice cores. So going back uh, present day on the left, 400,000 years on the right, and you can see different changes in CO2 at the top and different changes in uh, methane at the bottom, and then different changes in the middle curve, it's different changes in temperature. So the higher peaks for temperature uh, relate to higher uh, amounts of greenhouse gases, uh, be it uh, CO2 on the top or, or um, methane on the bottom. And uh, we're currently where, at, where we're at, we are at, or in the current interglacial, uh, what's called the Holocene. Uh, but you can go back into other interglacials um, every 100,000 years, essentially. The last one in, in Europe, for example, is called the Ipswichian Glaciation. Um, interglacial, sorry. So that's uh, directly from ice cores, that direct, uh, fantastic, basically fabulous um, climate data. Um, also, lastly, and this is the last uh, last point to be happy because it's quite a long lecture um, to hear is on seafloor sediments. So seafloor sediments build up very, very slowly, only a couple of centimeters per year once you get into the deep ocean and once you're away from land of, of mud. But within those mud layers, and therefore because it's only every few centimeters, you only need a, a sea core, you know, a, a, a core of seabed sediment, which may be only you know a few meters long, but it represents several tens of thousands of years of Earth's history. And if you analyze at a very high resolution, every centimeter down that core, you start to see um, and analyze it for, for chemistry and for uh, microfossil content, you can start to discern a climate record and how you do that, um, which I think is on the slide, yep. Yeah, and you can use um, fossil organisms, especially microfossils. So seafloor sediments contain the remains of organisms that once lived near the sea surface. Plankton, so those organisms that form in the photic zone, so they're photosynthesizing the, um, the, the phytoplankton, or you get the zooplankton, which are kind of feed single celled organisms which are floating around in that zone, feeding off the, the, the phytoplankton. In this case, this is a foraminifera, a type of zooplankton, it's a single celled animal, um, a fraction of a millimeter across, uh, you know, they're very small. Um, but when they die in their thousands, millions, um, their little fossilized shells made of calcium carbonate in this case, or calcite, um, fall to the ocean bed and get incorporated, become part of that sediment. And you can look through a microscope at these things, identify them, uh, look at modern species and where they live in terms of temperature, etc., and therefore infer paleo temperatures. So the numbers and types of organisms change with climate is the key. Um, so core records have significantly expanded our understanding of past climate, a fluctuating climate during the ice age, for example, um, um, and, and through inter interglacials and glacials periods. Um, so that basically it's seafloor sediments and ice core records. Those two, those two proxies are really they're the two that really took us back over several hundred thousand years and we've got some great records now of changing temperatures um, ch changing uh, water temperatures but changing air temperatures and um, changing um, concentrations of, of greenhouse gases um, these deep sea cores are taken out from a, a deep sea uh, drilling project it's very international affair uh, north america europe japan in this case in the largest ship or it was uh, a japanese vessel here it is on this photograph and you can see it's got you know, basically a, a drilling rig, a very large drilling rig um, on board, and it goes out um, to the ocean systematically, is, is taking cores in this case, from all over the world's oceans, uh, ocean beds, and analyzing them partly on board, they have on, on board uh, labs, and then or, or taking them um, um, back to land to analyze further. Uh, so you can see them scientists working with 
the cores and seafloor sediments. Uh, here's actually on the ship itself. And um, basically they bring, they extract that core, take out the, the, se the sediment and every centimetre, you can see he's got a tape measure out. They'll be slicing it every centimetre and analysing it for uh, under a microscope for the different uh, microfossil content, uh, recording that. You know, basically doing microfossil counts, basically every centimetre you look down a microscope and you count 300 of them, uh, describe all the species, record all the species uh, in there of foraminifera, of things like diatoms and other types of um, single-celled organisms. Uh, but also you'll be measuring uh, changes in chemistry uh, of the sediment itself, etc. all sorts of uh, records. Um, and relating to those species of, of those single-celled organisms like foraminifera, they're made of calcium carbonate. You can actually I, analyze from that material, their skeletons, the, um, the, the oxygen content, the, uh, the oxygen isotope content in CO2. So CO carbon and oxygen uh, are part of that compound, CO2. And I'll go more into this next week. Uh, I'm not gonna delve, delve into the reasons how we get that. All I'm gonna just basically is just show you a chart of oxygen isotope climate records for the last 900,000 years now. And this is from uh, seafloor fed sediments and you can see up and down you can see the cycle related to glacial and interglacial again so cold so on the north is on the left so here um, uh, current day is on the left and we're going back 900,000 years so almost a million years on the right uh, the troughs are the cold peaks of the the glacial stages um, so here the actual peak what we call the uh, late glacial maximum was around about 20,000 years but there was a long prolonged cold period from around about sort of 90,000 years to currently, there was an interglacial around about 100,000 years ago, 100 to 120,000 years ago. There's a current interglacial, which started around about 10,000 years ago to present. So anyway, you get that same cycle, interglacial, long glacial, short interglacial, long glacial, short interglacial, long glacial, and that goes back through time. And we know that's been a natural variation through time. And these records show that. These, these deep sea sediment records and the ice core records show that. Um, and what it's caused by, which again, I'll talk about in the next follow on lecture, is sort of caused by natural variations in the Earth's eccentricity, as it's called, the eccentricity of its orbit, how elliptical or not it is. And that will make sense, as I say, um, next lecture. But that's, what's, that's what drives these long term uh, natural variations in climate. Um, these Earth Sun orbital changes, especially. Okay, that's it for today. Um, and the next lecture, which I'll make it a little shorter, um, is the second one on climate change. So, climate change part two. All right, thanks for joining, and see you soon.